wrong. Welcome to VMware Device Visualization for Accounting. Uh, we are excited to share our talk with you and also feel a little disappointed for we cannot arrive at DEFCON in person. Uh, and we do hope our talk will serve as a guide for anyone who's looking to start VMware security research. Is that a full screen I guess so. Uh, firstly, allow me to introduce us to you. My name is Jia Xinhuang, and Hao Zhen and me are both security research of Tengong team at Xianxin Group. And we are both interested in reverse engineering and visualization security. Yu Liu is our team leader, and our team consists of lots of people interested in wireless security domain, and we have a website to post our blog on it. So if you are interested in it, make sure to follow us. And if you have any questions, feel free to DM or email us. Uh, here is the short story. Let's describe our visualization by counting generally. We actually started to research visualization security from the end of 2022. And in that time, we basically know nothing about visualization. So. Why are we interested in it? Because visualization is involved in lots of hacking contests, and it's a very hard, very challenging target. And for myself, I want to reverse engineer it and learn how it works. So what have we achieved in last year? We successfully escaped from the paralyzed desktop on GigCon 2023. And we reported lots of workstation EXXI bugs to VMware. And we learned a lot, not just about visualization, but about the whole architecture of the entire computer. So, what can we bring to you today? Uh, firstly, we will introduce the VMware visualization architecture to uh, most people hunting bug directly from debugging the visual device is code, but we choose to take a bigger view. We studied it from reverse engineering the whole VMware visualization architecture, and this helped us to figure out which code and how they can be influenced by the guest OS, and hopefully it will bring some new idea too. Uh, and later, we will use the box that we found in USB visualization and the SCSI visualization to explain the possible source of thread in visual device. And anyway, a visual device is still the most cost-effective cost effective choice in visualization bug hunting. Okay, let's start the first part. We are more hypervisor reverse engineering. If you are new to VMware visualization, I do have some tips for you. Uh, the most important binary on VMware Workstation OEXXI is VMAX. Uh, it is responsible for starting the virtual machine and contains most of virtual device code. And no matter it is EXXI or Workstation, their VMAX is identical. And basically just use different system API. And in this part, we will use Workstation for example. And also, debugging VMware Workstation on the Windows can be much easier. Uh, OpenVM Tools shares a lot of code with VMX, uh, like IO function, uh, event loop, and this can really speed up your reverse engineering procedure. And also, as a, as a beginner, you may need to collect CVs. Uh, papers, device documents, and even check the QMU code. Uh, just uh, utilize every information you can find to reverse engineering. So, uh, first question, uh, where should we start? Uh, if you already learned something about hypervisor, there's always a loop that handles switch in or switch out of virtual machine. So we will locate the loop code and start reverse engineering hypervisor uh, engineering the hypervisor from there. Uh, also, we know that VMX is a user mode process, so it should access the kernel for switch in. So they should have a kernel module. And on Windows, it's uh, VMX86. And if we are talking about the 
uh, EXXI. Uh, it's just uh, directly communicated with the VM kernel. And uh, tools such as API monitor can help us analyze the communication process between the VMX and the host OS kernel. Uh, so, uh, of course, the uh, OS log string can help us to figure out the meaning of the device I/O control. Uh, so it won't be hard to locate the main loop code. You can see that VMX use the I/O control wrong VM switch into virtual machine and blocked blocked until virtual machine need to host to help. The VMX will get the return code of IO control run VM and call the corresponding user RPC handler to handle the virtual machine request. So, what is the user RPC? And uh, it's a mechanism that VMware designed for VMM to interact with VMX on host. And very similar to Hypercore, but on user space process VMX. And user RPC contains lots of code related to device emulation. And basically, it is the start of uh, device uh, emulation. Uh, and it will only take one argument, uh, which is the user RPC block pointer. And it's a shared area memory region. Uh, shared area is another mechanism for shared data with VMX and the VMM. Uh, you may not be able to see some data be changed in VMX because they may be modified in VMM. So if we want to know what is passed in user RPC block, we should figure out how the shared area works. And the implementation of shared area is related to creation and loading of VMM. So we need to study it from the initialized, initialization process and pay attention to every memory location course. And also remember to check the interaction between VMware VMX and the VMX86. Uh, we will notice that there is a ERF object called VMM block embedded into VMX binary. Uh, also, there are lots of VMM extensions stored in VMM blobs section. And these are also ERF objects. A VMX will link them with VMM blob in memory to construct the actual VMM bi binary uh, according to the user's configuration. Uh, okay, uh, let's take a look at the VMM blob. Uh, we can say uh, we can see there are predefined export sim symbols such as user RPC blob and their corresponding mapping address in the shared per VCP VMX section. And uh, some virtual devices require the shared memory too. So VMX will define this export symbol in it too. And after these symbols has been defined, VMX will calculate the total size of shared area memories and allocate the corresponding memory space. Now we have seen how shared memory were allocated but how do VMM access them? You will notice that VMM blob has two sections. Uh, one of them contains VMS GDT information, and the other contains the VMM's virtual address mapping information. And combined this information, uh, we will see VMX is res responsible for allocating memory and building the page table structures based on VMM blobs information. And the VMX86 gonna further populate the post table information and allow the VMM EOF file, which is constructed by VMX. And VMX, VMM blob, VMX86 work together to build the VMM's environment and mapping the host allocated address to VMM's virtual address. So if you need to know how to manipulate data in shared area region, you will need to check the VMM's code. Um, VMX choose to run which user RPC code handler is depending on the return code of the IO control run, VM run. So it's time for us to check how VMware's VMM switch works. 
And the most important structure uh, is cross page. Uh, it's a one-page one size memory region uh, located for each vCPU by VMX86. And it's responsible for storing the contest between VMM and the host, uh, just like the VMCS, VMCS in Intel VT. Uh, we can check the monitor loader section to see its virtual address on the VMM's environment. When VMX code the IO control wrong VM, it will cause the VMX86 calls the host switch to VMM code and saving the crew and CPU state to cross page and restore the VMM, VMM CPU state. And the operation to switch out is the offsite of this process. And now we can check the VMM's code to see user RPC is implemented through the platform user code. It saves the user RPC op code and the platform code invocation number 100 to the cross page. And the pl platform code 100 will cause the VMX86 to choose to return the US user RPC code to VMX. So when v I will control wrong VM returned, VMX can call the corresponding user RPC code handler. Uh, also, uh, whenever VMM prepare to call user RPC, uh, you will see VMM modify the user RPC block to transfer data to VMX process. So now we finally understand the whole user RPC implementation. And based uh, on this knowledge, we are able to further reverse engineering the device visualization. Um, for Port I.O. emulation, VMM will reserve the x86 I.O. instructions and may attempt to use the user RPC to call VMX to process. And not all of the port I.O. callback will be registered in VMX process. There are some devices implement their I.O. callback in VMM. For MMIO, in most cases, VMX associates the memory region with an ID and implement the callback in VMM. And most MMIO function in VMM automatically will call user RPC to handle the device emulation, but they may access the shared area to transfer data to VMX. So you need to check the code in VMM to understand what happened when you access the MMIO region in guest machine. Uh, also, physical memory access is another important part we need to analyze. Uh, we will not discuss too much about the memory mapping structure, uh, but you should know that on Windows, the main guest memory is mapped uh, as a file, and uh, on EXXI, it is mapped by VM kernel. When VMX get the physical memory region object, it will first check the object's type, and in most cases, it will directly access the point field. And the last interesting thing is we also found that on EXXI's VMM, uh, some visual devices MMIO will not always call user RPC. Uh, they will call user RPC only when hosted emulation is enabled, uh, instead of using user RPC to interact with VMX. They use VMK call directly call VM kernel to handle device emulation. So although VMX are identical on EXXI and the workstation, uh, visual device emulation code won't always be the same by default. And basically, this graph describes the result of our VMware hypervisor analysis. Uh, anyway, it is important for you to check the VMM code when you reverse engineering the device visualization. If you are not sure where device's data comes from, uh, you can go check the VMM's code. 
uh, if you are not sure how to trigger the device's code, uh, you can go check the VMM's code. And uh, if you want to find some new device's code, uh, go check for the uh, go check the VMM's code. Uh, okay, let's enter in the second part. Uh, VMware device visualization bug hunting. Uh, let's start from the USB part. Basically, we can divide the USB emulation into three parts. USB host controller em emulation, uh, like UHCI, EHCI, XHCI. Uh, the second part, VUSB emulation. Uh, these are objects described in the USB specification. For example, URB object, USB pipe object, and USB port object. And the third part, uh, VUSB backend device emulation. And these are actual USB devices such as Bluetooth, HID, and, and, and RNG, uh, and so on. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, when guests want to access the USB device, uh, it will need to put data in memory and access the host controller mem MMIO space. Uh, which will trigger the VMM handler's uh, MMIO access, calling the corresponding user RPC call handler in VMX. And then it will convert the data into URB object, and eventually processed by the backend USB device. Uh, if it tries to access the USB device plugged in the host machine, it will also need another service to help. And uh, we actually find bugs in all these three parts. The first bug is in the host controller part, and it's a, un, it's a uninitialized memory. Uh, before we start it, let me just explain some concepts. In control transfer, a USB device accept a type of request called a standard device request, uh, which begins in the format of set set up packet. So it will be 8 bytes at least, and it has a double length field, indicates the length of subsequent data. And the USB device may use this type of data, but the host controller do not transfer data based on this unit. For example, in UHCI, data is tra transferred in units of transfer descriptors. So when VMX handles the UHCI emulation, it retrieves the first TD on quickhead and uh, extracts the double length field from the setup packet, and use this size to de determine the size of data buffer for ERB object. Uh, after a location finish, it will copy the data into ERB object, and they do lots of check to prevent buffer overflow. And let's back to the location process. Uh, it's actually when uh, we're depending on the target USB device when you uh, you are transferring to a different type of backend USB device will result in URB object with different fields. For example, a HID device will allocate URB object without additional fields besides the data buffer of the URB. Uh, also. HID device will use malloc for data lo location. Uh, so there are some problems here. Locating W length size URB doesn't mean you will get the W length size data from guest supply TDs. And malloc allocation left the memory uninitialized. Also, backend USB device will return data through the same URB buffer. So it will eventually lead in the heap data leak to the guest OS. And the second bug is the user after free appeared in the USB emulation code. Again, let's first explain some concept. Uh, in XHCI, there is a structure called device context which stored in uh, stores the USB device status. Uh, it is constructed by device load context and uh, endpoint context. 
a device slot connects hold the USB device information. Endpoint connects hold the information for a single endpoint. Uh, also, each endpoint has one or more transfer rings. Uh, they are transfer and uh, the transfer requires blocks on the transfer rings, and XHCI transfer data based on this unit. Uh, in order to expand this bug, we need to look back at uh, old bug. And uh, the old bug's part is very interesting. It only alters the sequence between the codes to release transfer ring and the code that assign values to endpoint connects. Uh, let's first uh, figure out how transfer ring release works. Uh, first, firstly, uh, it will get transfer ring object from the endpoint context. Then, it will retrieve the VUSB device object based on the USB port number saved in the device load context. Uh, then, it will obtain the VUSB pipe object from the VUSB device object based on the endpoint ID. And after that, it will release all the ULB object on that VUSB pipe object. And finally, it will release the transferring object. Uh, also, it will release the possible ULB object on backend USB device, in case they may be dangling pointer on backend USB device. So, it seems no problems here. Uh, however, it's actually not the ERB object could be come the dangling pointer. Uh, it is because that the transferring object pointer is not only held by the endpoint context. A ERB object also holds a pointer that points to a field of transferring object. And this field is res responsible for tracking the corresponding TRB when XHCI return the USB device response to the guest. And before the part, XHCI command like configure endpoint could modify the endpoint context con contents before release it, releasing the transfer ring. So it may lead the type stored in endpoint context mismatch with the VUSB pipe object type. And this will cause the function written without a VSB pipe object and left the ERB object on that VSB pipe object not be freed. And the, the previous pointer now becomes the dangling point and causing user after free. So now our question is, after this patch, is it possible to make the VSB pipe object mismatch again? We know VMX will need to check the port number stored in slot context to find the VSB device object. So, if we can modify the port number, it may lead VMX find a wrong VSB device object. So, if in that case, it will also find a wrong VSB pipe object. We do have address device command can make this possible. You can see the address device command only modify the slot context and the control and the point context. So, firstly, we finish the device configuration process, and we create the transferring on non-control endpoint. And then we transfer URB data on these transfer rings. And in the end, we use the address device command on that device to modify the device port number. Now. If we try to release the transfer ring on that endpoint, it will fail to find the right VSB pipe object and causing UF again. So, this is a bug happens between host controller and the VSB emulation. And the cause is it fails to manage the object lifetime in VSB emulation. And the third bug is in the USB backend device emulation. Uh, and it is out of bound read will be triggered within the system API. Uh, let's start with some concepts. The guest OS communicates with the smart card through the virtual smart card reader. And the guest OS uses CCID protocol to interact with the virtual smart card reader. Uh, 
the application application data you need APD serve as the payload for interaction between the smart card reader and the smart card and uh, you can see their relationship are very like the host controller and the USB device and you may already see that both of these data uh, structure has the length field and it is always need to be careful handling this length field uh, VMware do checks whether the message land field of CCID protocol match the land field of command APD. Uh, but it uh, fails to verify whether these two fields conform to the size of URB buffer. It directly uses this field as arguments to call the Windows SCART, SCART transmits API. Uh, clearly, SCART transmits cannot check whether the lens match the data buffer. So it will out of bound access to the heap data and write it to the smart card on your host. Also, you may be able to read it back. So it's uh, kind of interesting. Uh, okay, in conclusion, it's very challenging to defend such complex system. The USB emulation can be attacked. A USB device emulation can be attacked. And the host Host controller emulation can be attacked too. Uh, also, we still have uh, cases cannot present, but you can defer the binary to find. Uh, and uh, maybe more attack scenarios in the future. Uh, maybe plugging an uh, evil USB device and uh, leverage the VMX to execute, execute the code, or leverage lo local USB service to privilege escalation uh, and uh, anyway uh, that's the USB part and the uh, next part will be presented by my uh, colleague and uh, we will show you that how SCSI works different on EXXI and the workstation by default Hello everyone I'm Zheng Hao. I'm the speaker on this topic. Now it's my turn to expose VM kernel, a whole new attack surface. But I will first talk about some differences between ESXi and the workstation, because our new attack surface is hidden in these small differences. ESXi is a tip one hypervisor that runs directly on the host's physical hardware, while Workstation is a tip 2 hypervisor that is installed on top of an existing host operating system. Workstation supports more configurations and devices than ESXi, which means that in certain situations, Workstation can be audited at more points than ESXi. In some specific device, the data flow direction of ESXi and the workstation is different. Next, I will take SCSI device emulation as an example to demonstrate the vulnerabilities on different attack surface caused by different data flow orientations. This is an overview of the SCSI data flow. You can see that there are two parts for writing data to the disk, one through VM kernel and one through VMX. These are two completely different code parts, belonging to ESXi and the workstation respectively. The specific code parts of SCSI in workstation is shown in the figure. If the user calls the MPI function SCSI IO request command, it will enter the OSI logic MPO process SCSI IO message function, where it will confirm whether their environment is hosted emulation Finally, the LSI logic hosted process SCSI IO message function 
calls the relevant handler in VMX through user RPC. The specific code parts of SCSI in ESXi is shown in the figure. ESXi divides the situation into whether the environment itself is in hosted emulation. If it's in hosted emulation, it's the same as the workstation parts. Otherwise, it goes to OSI logic BMK process, SCSI IO message. Go to VM kernel through VMK call arguments. Because of this small code gap, ESXi has a new attack surface that workstation does not have. Next, I will introduce the vulnerabilities I found on these two different parts. The first vulnerability we will talk about is located in VMX, and the official description is out-of-bounds read-write vulnerability. As a tool for storing data, stability is the most critical and basic requirement for disk. VMware implements corresponding disk verification capabilities in device emulation. One of the disk verification capability is to detect data corruption through checksum. This is where the vulnerability occurs. Before we start, let's first introduce a SCSI command. In the, SA, in the SCSI command reference menu, there is a command called write16 that allows the operation of 8-byte logical block address and 4-byte transfer length. This shows that we can use this command to access any address in the 64-bit space provided there is no disk capacity limit check. VMware did not implement the disk capacity limit check in its disk verification program implementation. As can be seen in the figure, after applying for a heap of a corresponding size according to the disk capacity, only the operation is checked to see if it's a read or write operation. Obviously, this is a heap overflow. The write 16 and other read and write commands in the SCSI commands reference menu allow us to access any H byte address. This allows us to easily perform arbitrary read and write operations. The vulnerability we will discuss next is located in VM kernel, and the official description is out of bounds read. Still start with the SCSI commands reference menu. In the SCSI commands reference menu, there is a command called unmap, which can unmap one or more logical basic address. The structure of unmap itself is relatively complex and is divided into three parts, unmap command, unmap parameter list, and unmap block descriptor. Let's first look at the structure definition of unmap command in the SCSI commands reference menu. The focus of the figure is the parameter length, which indicates the total length of the unmap parameter data. The unmap parameter list is divided into two parts. Unmap parameter list header 
and uh, unmapped block described data. The unmapped parameter laser header consists of three fields. Unmapped data length, unmapped block described data length, and uh, reserved. The unmapped block description consists of two fields. Unmapped logical block address and a number of logical blocks. These two fields indicate the starting address and the length of the block that the user wants to unmap. This is an overview of the three unmap structures. So, that everyone can easily understand the structure of the unmap command. The three structures are very closely related, and uh, we will focus on parameter list length and uh, unmap block description data length. Both fields indicate the length. Unmap block description data length indicates the length of all subsequent unmap block descriptors. Parameter list length includes not only the length of all unmap block descriptors, but also the length of the unmap parameter list header. Let's see how VMware implements the unmap command according to the SCSI commands reference menu. Before actually running the unmap command, the VSCSI check unmap CMD function will be entered first. In this function, a heap of the corresponding size is requested according to the parameter list length, and all the unmap data is copied to the heap. After the unmap data is copied, the content of the data will be checked. But it forgets to check the relationship between parameter list length and unmap block description data length. And the number of unmap block description is determined based on the unmap block description data length. The user can set a special parameter list to carry a large number of unmap block descriptors, but only check the first unmap block descriptor. Check completed, enter the actual use stage. According to the code in the figure, parameter list length is used as the boundary length which allows the previously unchecked unmap block descriptor to be put into use. The unchecked logical block size is used as the size variable in the code shoe in the figure. An overview out of bounds right. In fact, it's this out of bounds right that actually caused the crash not the so-called out-of-bounds read. Regarding the new attack surface of VM kernel, I have summarized the following three major points. Modify the existing sandbox protection mechanism. Elevate the current process privileges. Virtual machine escape. Okay, thank you for your listening. If you have any problem, you can contact us with Twitter.